addition to uh, Lee Ream and Barb. Um, uh, sorry, I just had a pop up here. Uh, Lee Ream and Barb and everybody from C2. Um, they've 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 taken care of my cars. Um, Sean Frick has been a big help over the years. And um, ultimately, I just had to make the decision myself. And I was like, you know what, I'm going back to Q. And it's not really a popular fuel. Um, you know, I only know that because I had a, a smaller trailer with two cars in it, and I could only carry so much fuel. So my fear was always like, if I run out of Q, there's like, nobody other than the Millers that might have some. <laughs> yeah. So ultimately, I think over the winter, really, you know, kind of getting my carburetor right. Um, and ultimately deciding to go back to Q, um, I think was, was definitely an advantage for me. Um, I, I, you know, I didn't even realize this until uh, somebody told me, but actually each of my cars um, lit up the scoreboard at some point over the weekend with a 900 run. So I was kind of like, okay. yeah, yep. I might, must be doing something right. <laughs> so it gave me a little bit of confidence. Yeah. That, well, you mentioned working with Gary Stinn, and obviously we're happy that Gary's back and back on the road to recovery after what happened. But I think Gary Stinnett would tell you the same thing I've learned from him all these years. Eventually, you hit a point in your racing career where you stop wondering if you're going to win and you start planning on how you're going to win the round. And it yeah. sounds like you're in a spot making the decisions that instead of how your friends react to the crazy ideas you have, your friends are probably going to start saying, well, that's how Mike does it. Maybe I need to look at doing the small things too because it's <laughs> the small details. And it's rolling up there saying, gee, I hope I win. No, it's how am I going to win this? And it sounds like you have that confidence. And to have that the first week of May, you can't buy that anywhere. That comes with a lot of work. So Yeah, I mean, I, I've been at this since 2014. And, um, you know, with, with the help of all of my friends, I mean, uh, most of my friends have several Wallies at this point. It's um, you really can't stop trying to find a different way to make your car better. Um, you know, Jake uh, and Kelly Barbado were, were a huge help um, also on the carburation side. I just um, ultimately had to make the decision myself. And I'm like, you know what, as crazy as this sounds, I'm going to make a couple of changes um, because, you know, even my dad, my, my brother run ProMod, my dad's like, but if your car runs good, should, should you really make any changes to it? And I'm like, but dad, they could always be better. <laughs> and so I got to that point um, and, and I just said, I'm not going to stop. Uh, until they're pretty much dialable and uh, dialable and, uh, and I'm happy. And the wind was very tricky. I would say, you know, looking at the race, probably one of my toughest rounds was round two against um, Jeremy, Jeremy Mason, who I actually lost to in round one of Super Gas. Um, and, uh, you know, it was really a call like pulling into the water and looking at the flags and just saying, hold on a second, we're dealing with like a wind situation here. And uh, if you look at the run, it was, you know, I went 890 with a zero. Um, we were both pretty good on the tree and and Jeremy went in 89.8. So, you know, without that two thou, it, it would have ended my day. And as you know, this racing, like <laughs> you can be, you have to be good, you have to be great and you have to be really lucky. So um, that was probably, as people ask me about, um, you know, where in the race were you a bit nervous? I, I'd say, it was probably round two. The final, I think, goes without saying. <laughs> yeah. Well, you bring up a good point about Charlotte. It's got that wall, that retaining wall, and it's tricky because the wind gets caught up in there, and there's a small gap between that wall and the grandstands. And a lot of people told me there's a spot on that track that can throw you. It sounds like, obviously, you're on top of it. So, yep. Yeah, I, I focused more at this national event with, with Jason O'Teary on – on focusing on the wind more than anything else. And, you know, in addition to the wind, the track, because we can all look at a weather station, you know, our, our crew chief pro system could do the math, you could do it by hand. And, and I could tell you what the vapor is doing in the barometer, but it's the parts that, you know, are not so easily quanti quantifiable that I think is where, you know, when I come back from a run and I lose and, um, or I go, you know, 10 thou or 20 thou too fast. And, and I just say, well, well, we're gonna chalk that up, you know, just blame that on the wind. I, I wanted to move away from that, Scott, and really start saying, I wanna have a sense of, of how that's gonna impact my car before the run versus using it as an excuse after the run. Yeah. Uh, yep. So that's that's what got me in at, at ACO. Um, and uh, I try I, I try my hardest to learn from, from previous round losses. Um, and that's definitely what, what was helpful, um, this weekend. And, and I'm, I'll be the first to admit it. I had a couple of, uh, lucky rounds there and I'm, I'm okay with that. <laughs> Part of the deal. So yeah, you can't really get through six, seven or eight rounds without, uh, a give me at some point throughout the race. 
take no, luckier than good any day of the week sometimes too correct no. yeah i'm 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 okay with that <laughs> <laughs> the, the so Mike, what, cash is either way yeah sure. what's that uh what's what's the rest of 2022 looking like for you schedule wise um yeah, so, you know, it's an exciting year for us. Um, like I mentioned earlier, we have a, a new truck and trailer that, that'll haul the cars. We also have a third car. We got a Vegas station wagon to run in Super Street. So that's the exciting part. The challenging sort of real world um, issue that I'm dealing with is I did just start a new job two weeks ago. So <laughs> I'm trying to balance like having the opportunity to race every weekend with like being an adult and actually showing up at work on Friday. Um, so I do plan to run the Division One series um, because with the super gas car, we're still, um, that C2 converter machine is doing pretty good. We're, we're leading the, uh, Jags all-star points. Um, so that's Very been nice. a goal of mine for a long time. And I would love to, um, to be able to race in the, in that program at, at Indy. Um, and then we'll, we'll go to as many nationals as we can, you know, somewhere between, uh, here on the East coast and now, um, you know, probably, you know, through, uh, Vegas and, and Pomona toward the end of the year um that's if if i can get the time off from work <laughs> there you um, go right right cool um so how about the people that help make your operation run week in and week out yeah listen i you know i i first have to thank dwayne shields for sort of giving me this opportunity to to travel the country um in addition to dwayne uh, as i mentioned earlier gary stinnett jake and kelly barbado um everybody at c2 competition converters and machine um the east burns who put my dragster together um, I actually didn't even pick up the dragster when I bought it a year ago. <laughs> Josh called and said, do you want it? And I said, yeah, I, uh, I definitely want that car. <laughs> I said, but I have work and I'm not really sure like how we're going to do this. Like, can we pick it up in three weeks? And he's like, no, 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 I'm just going to take it home today. And then we'll start putting it together. <laughs> so uh, I've always said I've been in this sport blessed with, with amazing friends. Uh, you know, Sean Frick got me started uh, in Super Comp back in 2014 and put my first car together. Uh, the Reams put my Super Gas car together and take care of it. Um, like I said, the, uh, the, the um, sorry, Shane from Competitive Suspension takes care of all of my suspension work. Um, and then Kyle uh, and Kenny Koretsky have always been a big help um, from the start of my, my, my racing career from Nitro Fish. Um, my motor in the dragster, actually, most people don't even know this. It's not even mine. It's my dad's. <laughs> Everyone's like, oh, you have such nice stuff. And I'm like, it's, it's not mine. <laughs> then, uh, I'm very thankful to my dad and Scotty G who did that motor because uh, I have to tell you, after that last wind light comes on and you drive your car back, it sounds so much better. <laughs> I have to tell you, it's like, let's not touch this thing. It runs really good. Um, so, you know, to Joe Gallucci, who keeps all of my stuff sort of running week in and week out, um, you know, I think uh, my friends probably get tired of working on my stuff because I'll be the first to admit that I'm not mechanically inclined. I just get to do the fun part of driving and occasionally an oil change. And sometimes I, you know, do the little valve lash thing. Uh, but other than that, um, you know, VP Race Fuel and, and Lubricants have stepped up this year and um, they're going to be part of our program for the next two to three years, which is which is really exciting because uh, I haven't really had a big sponsor like that. So um, exciting to, to have them on board, exciting to have a new rig and um, uh, just bringing that Wally home was <laughs> was kind of crazy. That's awesome. Well, congratulations again. And, you know, great job in Charlotte. Um, like I said, you know, looking at your numbers, you know, you were you were on it in the final round. So yeah, I had to wake up. And fortunately, uh, it happened because I took a, a couple of deep breaths there, probably like 40 to 50, to be honest. Um, and uh, I played with that delay box way too many times between the trailer and that and that burnout box, taking numbers out, putting them back in. And uh, ultimately, it all came together. And uh, yeah, it's I, I'm very thankful for everybody who, who helps my program out for the friends that I forgot. I apologize. I'll, I'll never be able to get them all in. Jason Kenny, the Bodners, uh, Michelle and Rich, um, the Volpes. It's uh, it's it's a huge effort that happens every weekend, and um, you know it's it's definitely teamwork, and and I appreciate it. Well, very cool. Again, congratulations and best of luck for the rest of the year, and hopefully we'll get to talk about this stuff again soon. Yeah, I would love to. Fingers crossed. All right, man. Best of luck. We'll talk to you later. Thank you guys. Have a great day. Yeah. Have a great right. evening. Congratulations, Michael. Bye-bye. All right. Michael Handers, our, our winner from this past weekend in Super Comp at the Four Wides in Charlotte. So, Scott, buddy, how are you? Uh, doing well. Uh, 
you know, living the life and trying to get parts out to everybody who needs them. And there's a lot of parts that need to get out. And much like the rest of the industry, it's uh, kind of a thing where we have certain materials and components we can't get, but at the same time, we're just overwhelmed with orders and uh, really doing the best we can with the uh, 90 plus employees we have at Morosa Performance in Guilford, Connecticut, and at Morosa Wiretech in Philadelphia and trying to get stuff out to people. Very cool. Well, Pete obviously wanted to be on because he likes to pick on you and he knows you like to pick on him. And this whole, this whole thing was actually something that he brought up um, from a few weeks ago when we had the chance to talk to um, Brandon Bernstein from Lucas Oil. Um, Brandon mentioned through our conversation, you know, how important it is for the people that represent Lucas Oil in that case, to yep. to do a good job you know they're not like, you, nobody's perfect but to do a good job and um so pete and i got to talk in and then i reached out to you and you agreed to come on and you know because obviously moroso has been around for a long time and is very well known you know had their name at racetracks at events on cars and um just kind of figured we'd dive into it with you Sure, absolutely. Like I said, I've been at Moroso. It'll be 25 years this June. So almost half the time that Moroso's existed and <clears throat> from 1997 to now, seen a substantial amount of changes of what goes on, what the return on investment is and the different ways to promote it. And I've seen every way to make it really work well and every way that it highly disappoints you. And a lot of things have changed between social media existing and what we expect and probably what the racers need. So uh, it's uh, kind of an open deal and uh, I'll let you get started. All right, so let's start right from the beginning. That initial contact, mm -hmm. you know, I know it's different, somebody you know versus somebody you don't know. Yeah. yeah. Do you prefer somebody calling you up and saying, I mean, I'm not sure, first off, actually back up a little bit, do over. If somebody calls you, Scott Hall, and says, hey, would you be interested in sponsoring my whatever, do you say, mm -hmm. okay, hang on a sec, I need to put you through too, or do you have input on it? Well, I think I get initial input because obviously everybody in our department is familiar with certain types of racing. So if somebody was to call me and say, geez, you know, we're putting together a super comp dragster and, you know, looking to find financial sponsorship um, or product sponsorship. <clears throat> At that point, you kind of start the conversation knowing, well, let's get started and, you know, see where this goes. <clears throat> Initially, I always like to find out from a Moroso standpoint who the engine builder is, because I'm not going to give free parts to somebody so they can walk into their engine builder and say, hey, look what Moroso gave me. Or if I got an engine builder that's been doing business with us for 15, 20 years, I don't want to take away from that guy. So at that point, you're going to find out roughly what it is they're trying to accomplish and why. Um, it gets kind of dicey when somebody says, well, we got five cars and we need some help. Well, that's a nice problem to have. Um, you find somebody maybe has a certain type of sponsorship or a marketing program, or, you know, maybe they're different in the story of their team or who they are, or where they came from. And so you're always curious to see opportunities like that, because when somebody calls you, it's a matter of what are they going to do for our company? That's going to bring us more exposure. And then you're kind of curious to know what it is they're looking for. And, uh, you know, so you got to balance out because at the end of the day, I got to take care of my engine builders and our distributors first and foremost, and ultimately find out what someone's looking to get. So a phone call, it's kind of a tough one. Um, they happen, but places like the PRI show where you get to be introduced to people, uh, word of mouth from people who I do trust helps. And certainly just going to races and watching and watching a certain team that maybe impresses you with whether it's how they perform, how they present themselves, or keeping an eye on social media, which is really the new third leg of the entire tool, this entire thing. So I do some research on my own and, you know, usually eight times out of 10, you got to kind of say, well, let me work with your engine builder and maybe get you a deal on some parts, but that's about it. So. Right. You kind of, you kind of hit on my, on my next question. What do you look for in the, in the initial proposal? <clears throat> 
Initial proposal, I'm kind of curious to know how long it takes for them to tell me what they're going to do for Moroso. And sponsorship, that word is okay. I'd rather find a marketing partner, though. So I like to hear the terminology marketing partner. Um, as I discuss all this stuff, the pillars of the people that I've worked with, who've probably been the most phenomenal uh, partners I've had, have been both Don O'Neill and Megan Meyer. And they have certain things about them that when we talk, there's certain things we're both trying to achieve. And quite often I know up front what they want to do for Moroso. And that helps because that's what, that's how you're going to go about it. You may need a set of valve covers and oil pan from me, but what's your interest in our company and how you're going to help us out? It, that's got to be the presentation. It's, it's kind of dating where you got to kind of, you know, play both sides of the fence and find out and, you know, like to know that they know who the company is and what we manufacture and what we do. And quite often, depending on the age of the person, they may have grown up with Moroso decals on all the toolboxes and their father or grandfather using our product and talking about it. And uh, usually sometimes that's where the comfort level comes from as a reference or uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, yeah, reference of somebody in their family or friends to call me or somebody in a company like that. All right. Uh, again, <clears throat> you kind of just led into my next question too. After you see that initial proposal for you know a team or an event you know, whatever the case may be, mm -hmm. would you contact them and say, hey, you know, why don't you come down to our facility and we can sit down and talk about it? Or would you rather just do it over the phone? Well, I'd certainly rather go to the track and meet them in their environment. Um, coming to the factory is usually not an option just because of logistics and all that. And to be honest, Moroso, I can't remember when the last time we ever did financial support, typically it's product support. Um, Dollar support used to come in the in contingency. Now it's the whole point about the contingency program was we've paid out millions of dollars over many years in contingency. So to an extent, that was kind of how we gave back and not so much with individual racers, but more with sanctioning bodies. So people throughout the country using our product would get paid from us. Um, as far as product sponsorships, typically I you know, we have to see some type of a you know long-term investment that they've already made into the sport and into our product and again have good references and relationships with the engine builder the chassis builder and people that we see hey this person can do some good for us whether it's r d whether it's exposure and nowadays whether it's social media coverage for us specifically, I specifically it's kind of open-ended but let's go as specifically what do you look for you did kind of hit on it you know the social media and stuff like that does it matter if it's a pro team a sportsman team or even you know the guy who's a weekly bracket racer what what do you look for specifically in that that person or that vehicle or the combination of the two yeah that typically what we look for is because I'm very engineering driven and trying to develop product. I'm gonna work with somebody who's gonna give me feedback on stuff. Um, if you're already running our products and they work, well then apparently we've already done our job. My interest is finding people that, I wanna find the driver that works on the car. I wanna find the team owner that works on the car. Um, maybe builds a certain component, does it build transmissions, engines, chassis, whatever. I got to come away from it, whether you win or lose, what kind of knowledge is our company going to gain? And that's one of the legs of this thing. So I said before, there's three legs to this. The one is the presentation they give to the outside world in talking about our product. Do they make it a point to let people know, man, we got this brand new XYZ part and we're seeing how this thing works and it's working good and man, it helped you out and that's word of mouth, that's advertising. The next thing is giving me feedback saying, hey, you know, we're willing to put this thing on. Maybe have a little trials and tribulations or, you know, we're willing to swap an oil pan out on a test and tune before a divisional versus being like, oh, no, this, you can't touch a thing. It's been like this for the last four years. And, you know, we need people that give us some feedback. But one of the most important things is give us feedback when something fails. You know, something goes out and cracks or breaks or whatever doesn't work. They're not, you know, end of the world bashing us or like, hey, we're on board trying to help you. And that's why having hands-on people really help. Now, the third leg is where the people that maybe aren't hands-on, but they're very good with the social media aspect, the advertising aspect, 
That's the new thing that, you know, there's people out there that when they get a product, they actually show you bringing it in and opening it up and talking about it, discussing, you know, this is new because or this or that. And they put the time and effort in to let people know that while we advertise, I like that person explaining what the part is, why they're running it, and as successful as they are, why they want to go this route. That's good advertising, and it's quick and it's easy. And you only got to be so personal to do it, and you only got to have so much skill to edit a video and do it. But if you care about the company that's you're working with, whether it's an oil, a fuel, Moroso, tires, whatever, if your well being is based on how well that company's perceived, you're the person we want to have perceive our product. I can do it. We can do it in ads, but it's great when that popular driver who has all the following puts on a video. And I mean, Dean Carnes, stinky pinky, that guy's the best. I sent him something and there's a video up as soon as the thing rolls off the UPS truck and it helps us out. And we want the personalities of these people helping. That's the third leg that's important. But for me, I do want something that's going to give me input, willing to take the good with the bad sometimes and help us promote this thing. That's what we need from them. So throw some some real world stuff into it as well. Well, that's it. I mean, I want somebody where, you know, talks about, you know, geez, we're running a Morosa battery charger on this thing. And, you know, it's just, it's the best battery charger, does this, does that. And it's also multiple use because when the golf cart died or the, or the RV had a problem like that, or they could talk about how much faster it charges up and promote the thing and say, you're going to spend all this money on this part. Here's why we've decided to buy four of these things. And it's not so much for giving you this. Some of the best people I work with to this day were full paying people for years. And at some point I made, made a decision saying, I want to work with these people. They've invested in our product. They like it. They give me feedback. I want to, if I'm going to have somebody R and D something, I want them to do it. And uh, sometimes you just don't make the phone call and you make it happen. It's putting in a couple of years worth of effort and showing that you're out there and doing it. And that's where people like a Don O'Neill or a Megan Meyer, I mean, they've been phenomenal people to work with, but initially we were friends and talked and they bought stuff from me. And eventually I said, you guys are the type to go do some good R&D for us. And they were able to come back and say, well, here's what we want to give back. And it's worked out well. Very cool. Appearance. Clothes make the man, as the old saying goes. Car presentation, team, and rig presentation. How important is that of a factor in this whole thing as well? So one of the big things that I'm real careful to do is not really judge people by the rigs and the RV and such, because, you know, at some point we can only afford to do so much. But there's a lot to be said about how people dress and about how people set up their pit area. Um, I am a absolute fan of anything Roger Penske does. And there's some rules that he has that are very basic that I follow. And I find that having a certain layout and continuity in your pit area matters. How you dress matters. I mean, it's hard to get all dressed up in the middle of July at, you know, at Echo during a divisional. But there's part of you that's got to look the part. And world famous Al Hanna always says, try to dress one step better than the people you're trying to impress. And I think there's something to be said about presentation. Matching uniforms are important, but you can't go spend all the money on a sublimated shirt. Have something nice, simplistic color, something that matches and shows that when you're not only at the trailer around the car, but in the staging lanes, you're just walking around, you care about the presentation you have. Because that says a lot about how much you care about not only what other people think, but how much detail and orientation you put into what you're doing. Colors, presentation, cleanliness, that stuff matters. I don't care if you got a 24 foot trailer that's kind of wore out, but when your pit area looks nice, your car is presentable and you welcome people in. And when people walk by, you say hi. You're not in your trailer 10 minutes after you made your run, never to be seen again. You're out and about. And that's how the conversations come up. Hey, how's the weekend going? Great. Um, trying out a brand new Moroso vacuum pump and da 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 da. That's the conversations you have. Being social has a lot to do with it. And I find that there's a lot of people of younger age that, yeah, they're social with their friends, but they got to kind of get out there and be more social with other people too. There's a fine line between being social friends and social, I want to beat this guy next round, but you know, you got to have a certain 
savoir faire about you because you are out there to promote maybe not only us, but other companies. And that's what you got to do. Very cool. All right. Um, this one kind of came to me th this afternoon <clears throat> while I was at work. Does having your business name on a car or your business name on an event mean that you only want them promoting Moroso at a racetrack or, you know, or the event being promoted only at the racetrack? I'm referring to events like, like local car shows, yeah. cars and coffee, things like that. Would you be happy to roll in Monday morning and you have an inbox on your computer full of pictures of, of whoever's car, you know, at a cars and coffee with a ton of people around it. And there's that Moroso sticker as bright as day right in front of everybody. So events like car shows and races, the biggest thing you're really trying to do there is just you're trying to promote your name. You're trying to promote the company that once again, people recognize it and they hopefully think of quality, longevity. Everybody's got a story about something Moroso and you like to get out there. Because when you look at a car show, um, as much as we want to get the young people involved, it's older people that are there. And you're probably just trying to reassure them that, hey, we're still here, we're still viable, we're still creating product. And so you like to see them around that with usually good stories and, and they're enjoying themselves. Um, the one thing we look at that is obviously there's a return on investment we want to get, but it's nearly impossible to measure it because hopefully maybe four or five people went online and looked up a, a part because, you know, they said, oh, yeah, maybe more also has that and so it's tough to always measure what you're getting back from that stuff but you're promoting the name and just having it out there and showing goodwill now one of the major rules about this conversation we're having is there's two things i've always said about either sponsoring a race or an event or something the two reasons you do it are a you're paying back and appreciating the people that have done business with you all this year and putting on an event. Or the second thing is you're trying to gain business by promoting your name. Obviously, lesser known companies try to get out there and say, hey, this is us and this is what we sell. We're going to promote things. Companies like us, I think of Steve Williams with the k and I think of you know, some of the mail order places and such. They're out there because they want to say, hey, thank you for you know, being a customer of ours and you want to give back. And it's a fine line because, you know, everybody that owns an Apple phone is not waiting for Apple to, you know, send them a check or a contingency check or thank them or nothing. Right. We in the sport, because it's kind of a hobby fun industry, you got to show support back. And by supporting that local car show or something, there's party that likes to say, hey, look at the happiness that was affiliated with our name sponsoring a car show or sponsoring a race or a number one qualifier type thing or whatever. So there's marketing, there's return on investment. And there's also just an appreciation that you try to show the industry that's given you so much. Fair enough. Um, this is another question you kind of hit on a little bit earlier. Do the actions of one reflect on the whole? My, the point of my question is meaning a member of the team or an event that you have your name attached to demand professionalism at all times. So I guess what you're asking is can out of a, a team of four, can one person ruin it for the other three? Is that what you're asking? Yeah. So, yeah, um, you know, at the end of the day, I think how public those things become probably matters more i mean you know if you have a team that you work with and some evening one of them goes out and does something at the track that you know we've heard of the stories that happen and does it reflect on us personally well it kind of does but at the same time i'm also going to go to the patriarch of that family or the best representation and kind of you know say well at the end of the day if i'm here to get r d results or marketing results or whatever you know i can't let the action of one affect it because we have gained so much but i got to kind of leave it up to them to decide how to clean up their own deal quite often i think i get enough out of people with r d and support and help and even marketing stuff that you know you got to kind of look at where none of us are perfect and we've all been at the racetrack and had really good days and really bad days and maybe acted a certain way we shouldn't have it happens but 
you know, this is a sport of human beings. And um, I think if the, if it's a really rock solid relationship, you look past that stuff and you look at the good of what it brings. I have a handful of teams that I really work with and everybody's really good and so on and so forth. And there's so much we've gotten back from it that, uh, you know, things happen, I guess. And you just got to look at it from that standpoint. Gotcha. All right. This one kind of does, has something to do with it, but kind of doesn't all in the same breath. We've all heard the term rolling billboards. And this has been a topic that's been around, new, that's come up numerous times. Does a race car rolling down the road have more effect than one sitting in the box? Before you answer, I will preface the end of that question by saying, yes, I understand the, the, the safety and the security of an enclosed trailer, but going back to the day, you know, everybody's always said it's cool to see that, you know, Scott Hall's dragster mm -hmm. rolling down rolling down the highway behind this RV in an open trailer. Yeah. I've always said if I could build my nostalgia front engine car that I'd like to build, um, I'd put in an open trailer if I could, because you're going to get somebody who's five years old and 95 years old excited to see that thing. Um, there is a certain uh, romanticism about going down the road and seeing something like that on the back of a flatbed. It right. shows that you're a racer because what matters is the car. You're willing to show the public and people, hey, here's what we got. And hopefully you're saying, hey, come check this thing out. But I think for a lot of people, it's that whole visual thing. It's basically it's a rolling car show. And there's a lot to be said about that kind of thing. We all notice stuff like that. I mean, every single person will notice a road racing car on a flatbed or any type of a drag racing car. And yeah, I really think there's just a, a lost romanticism about that. But the problem is we've just got so much invested in unfortunately society in the world today or such that you can't even stop at the rest stop without worrying about what happens. But it would be great to be able to show the public, here's what we got. Because when kids and adults alike get excited about it, you gotta remember that we are in the entertainment business more or less. As much as we all take it seriously and want to win and doing whatever, we talk about, well, there's no fans in the stands. I understand, but when there is, you want to put on a good show. And uh, how you present yourself and could present a car on a flatbed going down the road, that's that you'd love to be able to do it. There's no doubt about it. You watch the old videos from top fuel cars in the 60s racing five days a week. That was part of the lure. Right, right. Like I said, I mean, I, I get the safety and the security thing, you know, like, I get, like you just stated. You know, unfortunately, in the day, date, and time that we live in, it's, uh -huh. you know, it's part of, it's the way of the new world, yeah. you know, short of being under, under a, somebody in there with a gun, you got to, you know, protect your investment. There's a certain part of it that uh, if someone has $50,000 to spend where they spend it, you know, the RV, I argue nowadays is as crucial as anything because, Ultimately, it's what gets the family out to the track and enjoys themselves. Right. The race car obviously is important because, you know, that's what you're there to use. Um, the trailer to me is it's third on the list and definitely is. I'm not a big trailer guy. I don't care how my stuff gets there. Uh, my dad ran successfully nationally with a four and a half foot tall, 24 foot trailer and beat the likes of people that had a lot larger rig and the trailer doesn't have anything to do with how well that car runs on the track. There are parts of it that matter, but you know, you like to know that people are spending that money and what they're doing with their money. I mean, going back to the sponsorship and stuff like that, I've gone and worked with teams that have so much money tied up into things that I'm not going to say are not important, but when they're begging and pleading for help and you look at how their investment is it's not my place to decide this stuff isn't worth it. But at the same time, it's like, well, you, you probably wouldn't be $10,000 short if the race car was a priority and not that widget over there. And, you know, again, it's people's enjoyment and fun, but they got to be careful how you present yourself, you know, to companies that you potentially want to get financial backing from. I don't want to be here to help you be able to go to the next race. I want to be here to improve the program that you've invested wisely in. And I guess that's the best way I can put it. And investing wisely is very dependent on who you are. Cool. Um, another random question that has come up 
through different places I've looked. Kind of doesn't have anything to do with sponsorship, but in a way it does because with nobody to see the stuff, it doesn't get seen. Is drawing a crowd the job of both the track and the racer or just the track? Now, again, I'm going to preface this question with something that I heard a number of years ago um, when I worked at a circle track in northern New Hampshire. Not my job to promote this race from a, from a competitor. I definitely think a lot of it has to do with the track because the track has to know the local community, the people that are there, what their financial situations are, whether you're in a small town that doesn't have a lot of money to spend or you're in a larger part of the country that maybe can't afford to go and spend more money on stuff. Advertising has a lot to do with it. Um, how you promote this for families and not just individual people. How you promote the racing. Um, I guess the kindest way I can put it is you don't expect the zoo animals to promote it. You expect the circus to promote the people that come out to see the zoo animals. Well, you can't expect it because the racers are the participants. And I think that uh, another Al Hanna thing is that, you know, do you think Michael Jordan has to pay to go play basketball? No, he comes in and he's part of the entertainment. He's, you know, part of the program. We're fortunate we get to race for prize money while we do this. But I think the entertainment has to be sold to the fans by the track. And they have to show and provide a return on their investment and make them want to come back. Obviously, the quality of racing has a lot to do with that. But the quality of racing is always going to have to do with rules, purses, and just how the racers get treated, too, and you know how important that is. I've always said that racing is everybody's alter ego. Uh, people work you know, five days a week to provide for their family and such, but when they get to go racing, they get to be their alter ego. And uh, you know what they're out there willing to race for and put the time in for has a lot to do with the sanctioning bodies on the tracks and them promoting and bringing in financial support to race for. And uh, I really do feel like it's the sanctioning bodies and the race promoters to sell the product. And a lot of that is adjusted by payout and rules and you know just how they're treated when they're there. Sometimes the more effective races are quick and fast and short term, but they have excitement to them and are well run. And when someone, some of the best races I've seen, even in circle track racing was when a ridiculous amount of money that had been built up over a month or two over the summer was raced for one night. That's the best racing you're ever gonna see in your life. And that's up to the track to promote that. All right. Out of everything that we've just talked about, if there's one thing that I missed, in the mind of Scott Hall, what is that? And would you like to put that out there? I think the biggest thing is I want people to realize is that companies like ours, like a lot of other companies I know of, again, there's two ways we're going about this. We're trying to market our name with you, or we're trying to do R&D and improve our product with you. Either way, we need to know that you on your own are making the investment to race and put on the best show and the best appearance possible. We're not there to get you weekend to the weekend to the next one, to the next one. We're there to help make your program better by our, our input, our sponsorship, our marketing with you. And so you can't go into it looking at us as cash cows. Um, we have employees, 401ks, bonuses and things that we have to take care of a lot of our own employees to do. We know our success is based on how we're represented, not only how we represent to the end user, but how the end user perceives us and hopefully spreads the word when we're doing a good job. Well, that being said, it's definitely a two lane road between all of us. We rely on the racers and the engine builders and the chassis builders, you know, the, that's, our live, that's our livelihood. And so when we can find the right people to help enhance our deal, it works out well. I think one, thing that gets lost sometimes is that when you are doing this as your hobby your getaway from the real reality some of the responsibilities that come with having to give back to companies can be big and i think that's where a lot of the failures occur is you know it's assumed geez if i do a little bit of this a little bit of that that'll be enough well sometimes it's not enough and again some of the best people i've worked with have gone above and beyond 
what we had asked and with their talents of social media or just being personable or having a very good R&D feedback structure, they give us back more than what we asked for. And at the end of the day, that's got to happen. There's got to be a point at which we go, man, that was so cool to work with those people. We're going to continue to do that. And whether it's product or financial, you know, I think of the best, one of the best people in this industry that knows how to do it right is a guy named Phil Valdir out of Michigan. Phil's got five or six stock super stockers. That guy for the last 10 or 12 years goes to PRI and walks out of there with checks that he picks up at the booths of these companies. Phil is probably the most phenomenal return on investment guy who works with these companies. And the guy is a master at this stuff. And I've listened to what he says and he makes sure that he gives back more than what, you know, the company thought they were going to get out of him. And he knows how to do it right. Very cool. Nothing wrong with that. No. So I think in we the covered. Book, yeah, I mean, the big thing oh. I just, I guess I just want to say is, you know, I want everybody to go on race because they enjoy it where the perks that come with this also come with, you know, responsibility. And sometimes you just want to go race and you want to wear a pair of beat up shorts and sandals and a, and a t-shirt and hang out and chill. And that's okay too. You got to go out and enjoy this. But, uh, you know, there's a lot of companies out there that we all, we all rely on the racers and the engine builders, and the end users as much as anything. So it is a two lane road. Cool. All right, Scott, what are you doing in 2022? I know you last time we spoke a few months ago, you said you were kind of retiring from racing. Well, well, we, my wife and I, who've had a very successful top dragster program for many years, um, just kind of hit a point where we ended up selling the entire operation while everything was working very well. But we kind of just hit a point where we realized we could afford to race the car, but we really couldn't afford to repair and fix things. And with a blown alcohol top dragster, things sneak up quickly. I literally do everything myself, build the engines, assemble the cars. I build my own weather stations. I mean, I do everything. And it just came to a point where uh, the pressure was just not, it was too much where I don't know if I could focus and enjoy it anymore. So we sold everything off. Um, I currently consult for about two or three teams in Division One right now, and the gentleman that bought my engine, I'm actually putting into an altered form that where he's going to run, run some top dragster with some building a car, basically from the ground up more or less, and um, just taking more time to probably just help people out. I really do enjoy giving back to all this stuff. Um, right now, I've got a Mountain Motor Pro Stock top sportsman car, uh, a large nitrous car and top dragster, and a couple blown alcohol deals, and I just like staying involved in the sport. My wife and I love the people. and That's been the greatest gift we've had. So I may not own a car, but I'm certainly involved in a lot of aspects. And I think at this point in my life, um, I'm very fulfilled by helping other people out and kind of keeping my hands in a lot of different avenues. So, so it's safe to say we will see you at Lebanon Valley and or New England Dragway still this yeah. year. Yep, yep. I'll be at a couple of events doing stuff. I'll definitely be at New Media helping out the one team. Um, I plan on having this car hopefully done sometime in uh, late July, early August and put some laps on it for the new owner and everything. So in between that and now that COVID's over, I can actually go back on the road, um, plan on attending some divisional and national events and more importantly, going to engine shops and chassis shops and just seeing our customer base. I really miss these people. I really just like learning and seeing a lot and uh, just kind of want to get it back out there and get back to normal and uh, Again, just appreciate the time I get to spend with everybody. So, very cool, very cool. It's, it's always fun to talk to you, you know, and and learn what you bring to the table and what you can share with everybody. It's just it's cool. I, I've every time I've talked to you, I've enjoyed it, be it in person or, you know, on here. Well, thank you. I, I want to ask you. I am so fortunate growing up in this sport. I mean, from day one, this is all I've ever been around. And um, I just get so much back from it. It's just fulfilling and blessing. And I enjoy, like I said, whatever stories or, or anything I can ever do to help anybody. I always want to give back to what this has done for me. So, cool. All right. Can I ask you an odd question? Go ahead. I love odd questions. All right. You're at work and you look on the shelf and you go, why do we have that part right there? I can't believe we stock it and I can't believe how many of them we sell. What uh, is it? 
<laughs> what is it? Um, it's funny, you know what I what I just look at. I'm like, why the heck do we still have all this stuff? There's, I'll give you three quick ones, and I'll tell you why. Um, advanced curve kits, um, carburetor parts, and um, man, there's another one. Oh shoot, I'll remember in a second. There's nobody in our building that I know that actually has ever used an advanced curve kit, but it's one of those products that we sell. And people call and need advice on it. It's like, oh my God, you know, we're all our 20s, 30s, and 40s. And it's like, how many of these things do we sell? And you go look at it. And you're like, how many distributors are still out there and being recurved all the time? But the components we sell and carburetor parts, again, I think I've, my one head of RD guy is probably a phenomenal carburetor guy. The rest of us, and there's so many carburetor shops and so many carburetor companies out there. Yet we sell so many of these parts, and it's like, how? Who? And we still sell stuff. Every once in a while, we go through the catalog. It's like, like piston ring installing tools. Why do we still have those? You can go and get them from other places. We still sell a ton of this stuff. And there's just some parts that people just know that we have that somebody calls us, hey, I need three of these, part number, whatever. I'm like, what the heck is that? Thing? I'm like, we still sell this? But, <laughs> you know, there's a certain comfortness. And then there's stuff like we got rid of the CC compression, uh, uh, compression ratio plate that you used to put on top of the piston and fill it. We don't make those anymore. And I have people call and they're like, why did you stop making those? And I finally researched and I'm like, because you get these pistons from the piston company and they tell you how many CCs the dome is now. And, you know, I just question how many good compression ratio numbers really exist. And it's like, why did we get rid of that thing? Um, so there is some stuff in the catalog that just alludes me to how or why we have it, but you know, we got to justify it. There's a lot of good stuff we've had to get rid of because you have to buy so many. Um, you can't justify some of the uh, purchase amounts anymore. Didn't you guys have like an oil pan for an Austin Healy or something? Yeah, one time we had that. We've got right now, we have got some pans for it's all these foreign cars with all these letters and numbers in the name. But I'll tell you, we've got stuff that we're building for right now that I wouldn't know what the heck it is, but it's out there. Actually, our number one selling pan is a road racing pan for Honda Civics, and we sell just an insane amount of these things. And uh, a lot of technology out there. Some of these newer engine platforms are just, they're going into everything right now. And while Austin Healy's are popular, um, uh, I can't say, again, I can't even remember the name of some of these things, a 2JZ is yeah. more popular and yeah. those are the people that are buying it you know i need 20 year olds and 30 year olds buying this stuff people in their 60s and 70s are probably not going to be our long-term customers anymore and you look at what these new people want and you build it right so at some point somebody stopped building tvs with tubes and stop <laughs> building typewriters and such and we're at the same point too i mean anything that you can put on an LS or a coyote motor or a copo deal is what's happening. So. Very cool. Well, Scott, again, I, I appreciate your time. I'm not going to keep you on all night. Like if Pete and John no, are here, but um, you know, I, I couldn't think of anything, anybody better to talk to about it. You know, you're a friend of ours and um, I appreciate, you know, everything you bring to the table. And uh, it's always cool to talk to you, my friend. No problem. Well, tell me that Brandon Bernstein is the one that came up with this. I met him when he started driving for Jerry Derry in uh, early 2000s. And there is somebody right there that shows presentation in the details because his father was absolutely brilliant at this. And Brandon, really, even driving an A fuel car, he took that thing on as seriously as anyone else did. And, um, he's a phenomenal person to be able to talk to about this also, no doubt. Yeah, it, it was it was a great conversation. Um, I was I randomly sent him an email and I was surprised when he answered me back and I was glad he did because it was a great conversation. It was it was a learning experience. Yep. So. Uh, he's got like I said, his father, I think, is one of the true pioneers of that part of the sport. And he was there for it all and, and did a lot on his on his own afterward, too. And I think he's uh, one about the best people who could really put a lot of insight into this. Yeah, learn like I said, learn from the best, the Budweiser King, yep. man. Exactly. 
All right, Scott. Thank you very much, buddy. No problem. Thank you, everybody out there who's taking time to listen to this. Uh, we all appreciate you. Have a great race season. Um, ignore the diesel prices and go have fun while we still can. So, <laughs> All right, Scott. Talk to you soon. Okay. Thank you, sir. Have a good night. All right. You too, pal. Bye. All right, Scott Hall, everybody, our guest this evening, talking a little bit about sponsorship. Um, and obviously, we had uh, Michael Handris on earlier, your winner from uh, the Four Wides and Super Comp um, in Charlotte. And with that being said, Pete was going to be joining us, but had internet problems. And I always joke with them, you live in Connecticut, man. You're not supposed to have internet problems. I live in New Hampshire. I'm the one that's supposed to have internet problems, and I never do. So what we're going to do to wrap up this year show is we're going to run through the results in this past weekend in Charlotte at the Four Wides. In Top Fuel, Mike Salinas over at Cameron Ferry, or Fur. Uh, John Forrest takes home the Wally and Funny Card, defeating Robert Height, uh, teammate. Uh, Pro Stock Motorcycle, Steve Johnson, two in a row over Karen Stouffer, top alcohol dragster, Corey Mitchellick, over Jasmine Salinas, top alcohol funny car, Sean Bellamure, over DJ Cox, factory stock showdown, Bill Skillman, over David Barton, pro mod, Chris Thorne, over Lyle Barnett, top fuel Harley, and it's also nice to see that um, top fuel Harley is going to be making some more appearances. So very cool. Comp eliminator Tom Ratliff, Ratliff, excuse me, over Bill Skillman. Super stock division one heavy hitter Joe Lisa defeated Jeff Long a Long Haney. Stock eliminator Darren Poole Adams defeated Jack Zimmerman. Super comp again our guest earlier this evening. Michael Handris defeated John LaBoose Jr. Super Gas, Craig Porter over Rusty Cook. Super Street, Jason Bader over, tell me if you've heard this name before. Another hot and hot and heavy hitter from NHRA Division I, Mid-Atlantic.90 Association. Of course, the one and only Porsche racer, Keith Mares. Top Dragster presented by Vortex Superchargers, Scott Neal over Zach Sackman, Junior Dragster Shootout, Matthew Peterson defeated Lincoln McMaster. So congratulations to everybody that won this past weekend. And we are, what are we, basically four weeks away from the national event at New England Dragway. Uh, joining us next Monday night is going to be Tori Iacono talk about her uh, debut, so to speak, and uh, her sister's Super Street truck. So I look forward to talking to Tori. First time ever talking to her. I think her, we've had her sister on like 15, 20 times. Uh, but again, we will be back next Monday night at nine o'clock. Look forward to seeing and talking to everybody. Hope you have a great evening. And if you are racing next weekend, somewhere, anywhere, drive safely. Wheels up, have fun, talk to you soon.